Okay. So, um, hi, I'm uh, Alexander Jelinek, and I'm a senior informatics architect at the HDF Group. Um, my background is applied physics and the satellite remote sensing. And uh, as a former active scientist, what brought me to HDF Group was uh, my pursuit of software, scientific software that was useful in my work and made me more productive. And the ways how conventions and, and uh, standardization help scientists achieve things quicker and better. So today I'll be talking about ZAR. And um, yesterday there were uh, several mentions of ZAR, so it was interesting. And uh, maybe my talk should have been earlier, I don't know, to preempt those questions. But here we are today and after lunch. So what I can promise you is going to be a very easy talk, nice after lunch. You can, you know, just ease back. Nothing too uh, difficult. Um, and um, so what is, oh, oh, I have to slide. Is it oh, forward, backwards? What's, oh, okay, here. Sorry, different soft, no, wrong one. It's Google Drive, I see. Okay, so talk about ZAR, and then I'll be talking about basically reading HDF5 data from ZAR API, and then how uh, HDF5 API could or can read ZAR data. So, you know, cross talk. So what is ZAR? I don't know uh, how many people online or here are familiar with ZAR, but it's, um, I would describe it as a fairly recent um, story schema for multi-dimensional arrays. Um, I, would, I would put it, it kind, I think it was first formulated in 2016, but don't quote me on that, but definitely late 20, uh, 2010s. And uh, uh, as I like to call it, the holy grail, it supports those three most liked and, and desired features when storing multi-dimensional arrays. It's groups, chunking and chunk compression. Uh, and um, as I'm aware right now, the reference implementation is a Python package. Uh, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised that there are other implementations of it in JavaScript. I think there is one maybe, maybe one in C++, but um, as far as I know, it's not really the only reference implementation currently is Python ZAR package. Uh, it's designed, um, with a, with a, at times when the object stores were already available. And so um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it shows it's a kind of a new generation storage schema. And um, one of the biggest um, design goals was to allow multi-process and multi-thread read and write from the, from the get-go. And um, backend storage right now supports, I think about seven or eight at least. Uh, but uh, anything essentially that provides a key value interface can, can basically be used as ZAR store. So it can be a file system, obviously cloud object store, key value databases, can be in memory, any kind of a, a dictionary style implementation in memory data structure can be used, that kind of things. Zip archive. The one thing I really want to uh, emphasize here is that ZAR does not exist as a file format. In other words, ZAR is proudly non-single file, at least for now. So uh, that's uh, so the consequence of this new age where you have these key value stores. So it was really designed for those kind of things. Uh, ZAR schema uh, is designed to be simple, that any scientist can easily understand it. And, and, uh, and use it. Uh, basically, uh, every ZAR object has a unique ASCII key. And um, I'll talk about the consequence of this, what that means. And the value of, of that key is, is a, some kind of a sequence of bytes. Um, and that's basically the fundamental uh, uh, property of ZAR schema. The ZAR schema consists essentially, or the ZAR schema metadata is JSON, and the content of the JSON is deliberately made to be very easy, very uh, uh, verbose. People can, even non-experts in file formats can look at it and basically understand what it means 
Um, uh, because of its Python heritage, the for, uh, basically the uh, the czar schema metadata about data types follows NumPy D type format. So someone who is familiar with NumPy D types can immediately look at it and understand what kind of data type is working with. Um, another interesting uh, feature of czar is that it only assumes that the chunks can be compressed by one, com one compression algorithm. In HDA5, you can have, theoretically speaking, any number of compressors applied to a chunk. In, in Zars way, there can only be one compressor. All the other uh, modifications on the chunk bytes that you perform are called filters, but there can be only one compressor. Um, and the chunk keys, again, the, the, the way how Czar describes chunks and the chunk keys um, include what I call logical array offsets. I don't know if that's the right name or not, but basically what it means that you take the first chunk element, which is you know the element of the chunk with the smallest indices, and divide it by the chunk shape. And you get these integers, and that's basically uh, those numbers go into how to form chunk shape. I can show about, about later. The, the attributes, the, the czar also have attributes much the same way the HDF5 has attributes. Uh, so the czar attributes are stored as key value pairs in another JSON object. Um, and so this is really the most quickest and, uh, and the shortest intro to the czar schema. So here is some examples to help you uh, understand how to interpret the czar keys. So for example, when you have a foo slash bar foo slash dot z group, uh, that means that uh, the foo and bar and the are the groups, czar groups that would be equivalent to HD5 groups. And essentially the dot z group is, um, would be a JSON object with just the one or two keys in it, but basically existence of dot czar group means that the foo and the bar are groups. And then if you have foo slash bar slash dot z array, that means that the bar is actually a czar array, the equivalent of HDF5 data set, whereas foo is the group. Because again, like much in the HDF5 case, the groups can have arrays and everything else. So, so it, it's very similar to HDF5 in those fundamental properties. If, if the full group wants to store some attributes, then those attributes go into the dot z attributes, z a t t r s JSON object. And, um, and basically that's how you organize things. And, though, and basically the hierarchy in czar is the hierarchy of these paths, foo slash bar slash something else slash, slash something else. And then at the end, it's either a group or a czar array. Uh, and as you can see, these are keys into a value store. So there is nothing else that establishes hierarchy in any other way. Um, the way how chunks data is stored is, for example, if you assume that you have a three-dimensional array, the first chunk of this three-dimensional array would be foo slash bar slash 0 dot 0 dot 0. And in the case that we have it, uh, what you could call, uh, I mean, not what you call, but the HDF5 is called contagious data set. That one, 0.0.0 .0 chunk, would be the only chunk for that data set. In other words, in the czar way, there is no contiguous or chunk storage. Everything is chunked in the way. It's only the question, do you have only one chunk or you have more chunks? And um, the second example with this 2.1.4, that basically tells you, uh, for example, how the chunk that starts with the element 20, 20, 1, 20 would basically be stored, assuming the chunk shape and everything else that I write here in the text. Uh, there is another way, I personally never saw czar data set with that kind of uh, setup, but this last capability where you actually use flashes instead of dots to separate uh, in the uh, basic to separate the chunk key part uh, is something that is permitted by the czar spec and basically allows you to have this kind of hierarchical sub chunk hierarchy within a chunk. 
Uh, I, as I said, personally, I never seen been, this being used, but it's supported by the spec. Um, and so that's basically, again, very, uh, very basic intro to the czar keys. Now about uh, what I said, um, basically accessing czar API, accessing HDF5 data from czar API. So um, in early 2020, just we, when we started hearing about some virus or something, um, I got a grant from the United States Geological Survey. It's an it's a agency of the federal government in the U.S. And, um, and they wanted to, to explore a possibility how HDF5 file data could be uh, read using the czar Python package. Uh, there is, there is a, a very dynamic uh, community in the geosciences that is building their cloud-based data processing uh, based on czar and this this federal agency was interesting to see how they can connect that community with mostly data in HDF5 and so um, the result of this work that I did was uh, a I proposed a new czar metadata JSON object that was called uh, you know as you could see dot z something and I called it dot z chunk star and basically what that was, uh, was a mapping between the czar chunk keys of one HDF5 data set with the location of that chunk in one HDF5 file. And that location was described by offset, where it is in the file, the byte it starts, and how many bytes that chunk has. And, uh, and then I modified the czar Python package a little so that it could accept this new Z chunk store. And that was basically the connection. All that was needed really to connect all this um, uh, czar based cloud uh, uh, analysis framework with, with HDF5 data. And um, we actually published a blog, or it's called blog, I don't know how it's called, on the medium. It's, uh, it's medium.com website uh, where we compared the performance of exactly the same data that was chunked exactly the same way, but in one case, the HDF5 file was already converted to czar. In the other case, the file was an HD, a single HDF5 file as a single object in Amazon S3. And we ran exactly the same processing with exactly the same software and everything else. And statistically, it was exactly the same performance. There was no difference. Uh, and the main reason why we kind of discovered is basically that at that time, and I'm pretty sure now even more, Amazon uh, was promising that it can successfully satisfy up to 5,000 concurrent requests for the exactly same object in their S3 store. So in other words, at, same, at the same time, if you go 5,000 processes go for the same object in S3, the, the Amazon will be able to serve it with no, with no uh, problem. And so basically that meant that whatever we kind of, whatever the load we presented to this situation was not enough to really overburden the S3 in any way. Um, so uh, this Z-Chunk store was very successful, uh, apparently. Uh, people liked it because again, there was so much HDF5 data and uh, they wanted to process it in the cloud. And so, um, the climatological community that was really vested in those things, and not only climatological, it was also oceanography. Um, that now this whole idea around Z chunk store lives in its uh, in its own Python package called Kerchunk. Don't try to <laughs> to understand why calling it like that. It wasn't my idea. It was a, it was a community's decision to call it like that. Um, and I worked with them uh, at the beginning to sort of formulate this transition. Uh, from Zchunk store to this Kerchunk. And, um, and now Kerchunk is part of the FS spec Python pack, uh, project. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. It's a, it's a Python project that aims to provide unified file based interface for many storage systems to Python. So HTTP, FTP, SFTP, S3, Google Cloud, Azure, you know, you name it, 
basically now work seamlessly. Um, and so uh, Kerchunk is now part of it. And what was used to be called Zchunk store, now it's called the reference file system in Kerchunk. Uh, and again, now the, the format of that reference file system is now newer, better, there are more features to it, but fundamentally it's still the same uh, philosophy. And um, turns out that besides HDF5, you can apply the same idea to many other file formats. As soon as you have ability to say where in that file format a chunk of data is, you can now write reference file systems for that file format and the software can go and fetch the data. So um, this community now, some of them is more uh, stable, some not, but basically they do consider GRIP2, TIFF, TSV and Parquet, for example, as being able to be read by, in, in this way. All right, thank you, five minutes. So, uh, quickly, HDF5 now, we go back the other direction. So from HDF5 API to ZAR data. So uh, this was really a proof of concept that I did. Uh, and so, because ZAR fundamentally is just a subset of HDF5 features, there is no way, there is no problem for HDF5 API to really support reading data from ZAR. So there is no problem there. And because ZAR's storage schema is conceptually equivalent to what we have in highly scalable data service schema or HSDS, it's really a very natural um, uh, possibility that HSDS could be reading data in ZAR without any problem. And that's exactly what, what I tried. I basically create a translator that looks into the ZAR metadata produces required HSD, HSDS metadata and the ZAR chunks stay the same and everything works. And so um, the access for, for HDF5 now currently for ZAR, I only looked at going from, you know, basically using HSDS. And I tried this for ZAR data in, in Amazon S3. And as I said, I apply, after that, I apply the same concept to NetCDF3 file format. Again, geoscience is more format than TIFF. And it was possible to do it. Uh, there's absolutely no, no problem whatsoever. And so uh, the implementation part, maybe it's a little heavy on technical things, but effectively, um, for those who are more familiar with HDF5, what you do, uh, you kind of have two HDF5 data sets. One is the anonymous HDF5 data set. The other one is the, the real HDF5 data set that is a stand-in for the ZAR array. And this invisible anonymous HDF5 data set essentially holds information about where are the ZAR chunks for that HDF5 data set. And um, to give you an example, for example, on the left you see kind of one of the ZAR arrays uh, and the information the way the ZAR Python package uh, reports about it. And then after conversion, uh, I provided some of the uh, information that exists from the HSDS side of things. And you can see now what was ZAR array now looks like H5PiD data set, which is equivalent to H5Pi data set. And then this particular data set, this is the one that uh, the invisible HDF5 data set. And I can show you, for example, the information here. And as you can see, the, the locations of the ZAR chunks. See the S3 slash slash something and then at the end, you see those 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Those are the, 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 chunk, the ZAR chunk keys that I mentioned earlier. And so basically, you have this mapping, and everything works really seamlessly uh, without any problem. So this is definitely doable. We didn't really provide any pol uh, polished way how to do it. But as I said, proof of concept was um, it definitely works. Now, the limitations, uh, obviously, there are more limitations coming uh, uh, for uh, when the ZAR data, well, let me start again. So limitations again for ZAR trying to read HDF5 data. So what are the limitations? Essentially in HDF5, you can create data types that are simply not possible in NumPy or supported by NumPy. So that's, that's where things break, for example. So ZAR can really only work with any kind of data types from HDF5 that are representable by NumPy. The other thing that uh, turned out to be a, a problem was HDF5 data of any variable length data type, because that type of data is not stored in HDF5 files in any chunkable way. 
there is no block of bytes with variable length data. And so you cannot use this method to getting it. So the only solution to that is that you actually read that variable length data and store it in JSON. Uh, again, applies to the compact data sets. That, does, that thing, compact data sets, doesn't exist in ZAR. So basically, you take compact data set and you store it in, in JSON. Um, it's not a big problem because compact data sets cannot be larger than 64 kilobytes. So it's not like a huge impact. Um, any other advanced HDF5 feature like object references, region references, um, uh, virtual data sets, anything that basically depends on the file system, that's not possible to support in this situation. Um, for both ZAR and HDF5, basically the no limitation is use of some kind of unsupported compression uh, algorithm. So ZAR maybe supports something that we don't have in HDF5 and vice versa. And that's that's one of the problem. The other, the other not limit. Well, it's a limitation that you have to translate HDF5 file into reference file system, or you have to take ZAR JSON metadata and translate that into HSDS metadata. So there is some processing effort that you need to do before this. Uh, you know, you can go between ZAR and HDF5. Um, and depending where that HDF5 file is, for example, if that HDF5 file is in the cloud already, uh, producing reference file system requires HDF5 library, and then HDF5 library is kind of doesn't have really good performance going after files in the cloud. So, Gert says I should stop, and luckily that is the last slide. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so any questions? Um, I have a question. Um, I, I think. Oh, is this a, uh, ah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, um, so, my understanding is that the SAR folks are currently working on a shard specification um, because they've realized that at very large data sets, that having many, many files becomes an impediment to their. Um, format or their system here. And so they've started working on a specification to put many chunks into um, a file. It might not encompass a whole array, but uh, at least a partial um, part of the array. Um, and so this seems reminiscent of HDF5's virtual data sets. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, that and the intersection with Chris Schunk and your previous work. So, yes, I mean, that's something that you could probably make uh, a two-hour session out of that. But once you, you do essentially provide either reference file system JSON, for example, or anything other, um, once you es essentially create a file manifest in JSON, then all kinds of virtualizations of that information are possible. You could, you could expose only some parts of, of, of your file content to, to users, you can aggregate across many, many files. That's basically what ZAR community is really interested in, and they're working a lot. That basically, I know cases of millions of files that they produce JSON that just ag aggregates uh, information um, and, and provides sort of a unified access to essentially data in millions of files. And because everything is JSON, it's very easy to generate very, very easy to share and very easy to sort of write software that can access and do other things. So um, there is a lot of possibilities here as long as you accept the fact that this is read-only data. So this is data that ca came to rest. There are no more, there are no more, more you know, writes. There are no more changes. Everything else happens very slowly in a very controlled way, maybe eventually sometimes. And everything that remains is just analyze the data as, as far as and as much as you like. So. Okay, thanks. We got to keep moving here. Uh, there will be more time for discussion this afternoon and tomorrow. Thanks, Alexander. <laughs>